the prime directive here, uh, ultra-crepidarianism is the habit of giving opinions and advice on matters outside one's knowledge. And so I don't want to do that. So I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an investment advisor. I'm not a sports writer. I'm not a sports economist. Not any kind of economist. I'm not a gaming industry analyst. What are you then? I'm mostly an applied mathematician, scientific application programmer. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, programming in R 15 years and counting. It's the closest thing to a native language for the way I think uh, that's ever happened in, in computing. I'm an open source hacker, a uh, master of science and mathematics from, uh, wait for it, University of, and that, Las Vegas. <laughs> and yes, I am a daily fantasy sports contestant. I play on a very, very low level, like a buck a day. You know, and, uh, I'm, not, I'm not, a, not a big time guy. And on a confession, I'm not really ready for some football. <laughs> for openers, the season hasn't started yet. I don't really like the game. Portland doesn't have a team. So I'm going to buzz through how the games work. But that's really not the interesting part. So a little terminology. In the following, players refers to the real world athletes who are in the games that are playing or their fantasy counterparts. And contestants refers to the people who enter the fantasy sports contest. So like Russell Westbrook is a player and I'm a contestant. Or if you're following baseball, Mike Trout is a player and I'm a contestant. So the first thing happens is uh, contestants sign up on a site. There's two big ones and a whole bunch of little ones. Uh, if you watch sports on TV, you've seen the ads for the big ones. I'm not going to mention their names. You'll see one of the names a little further down. Most of the sites have free and paid contests. Uh, for paid contests, of course, you have to deposit funds. And then to the lobby. Now, here's where it gets really, really messy. The lobby is a bewildering array, array of contests. It's, it's a web page. Uh, you can sort the list, but it, it's just mind-numbing. Uh, varying entry free fees, that's free all the way up to thousands of dollars. Uh, the varying payout structures, there's simple ones all the way up to really complicated ones. Uh, you can win cash or tickets to more contests. And the varying sizes, you can have two contestants go head to head all the way up to some big free rolls and tournaments with like tens or even hundreds of thousands of people in these contests. And some contests are single entry. One contestant can only put in one entry, and some of them are multiple entries. I've seen contests with that will take like 100 entries per person. Most popular sports are NFL, MLB, Major League Baseball, uh, NBA basketball, and college football and basketball. And the less popular sports are golf, uh, soccer, both uh, world soccer, the famous stuff, and the uh, U.S. Major League Soccer, NASCAR racing, and mixed martial arts. So our first decision science challenge is to choose a contest out of that whole, that whole array. So contestant chooses a contest. What then? Well, contests cover at least two real-world games, uh, usually more. Each contestant drafts a lineup with players from multiple games. And the lineup structure usually re 
pitchers and real world sports teams. So for example, a baseball lineup would have two pitchers and a catcher, upper, second, third baseman, a shortstop, and three outfielders. And an NBA lineup would have one point guard, a shooting guard, a small forward, a power forward, a center, uh, another guard, another forward, and a utility player. The salary cap. Here, here's, where, here's where it starts to get interesting. The players have salaries, and the lineup has a salary cap. The total of all the salaries for everybody in the lineup has to be under the salary cap. Um, so our second uh, decision science challenge is to choose the lineup so that each position is filled. You have to fill all the positions and you can't go over the salary cap. So the contestants have entered their lineup, but what, what next? The fantasy players in the lineups accrue points as the real world counterparts play. So for example, the pitcher, every time the pitcher uh, pitches an inning, he, he gets uh, points for that. Um, and if he strikes a batter out, he gets points for that. Uh, he loses points if he gives up a walk or hits or runs. The batters get points for walks, uh, hits, home runs, runs batted in, stolen bases. And the batters lose points if they get caught stealing a base. In basketball, they, they give you, the basketball players get points for baskets, for assists, steals, rebounds, uh, blocked shots, and double doubles and triple doubles. And they lose points for turnovers. When all the real world games are final, the contestant scores are tallied up, and where a contestant ranks among all the contestants determines, determines the payout, if there's, if there's any. So our third decision science challenge is to maximize utility in our choice of players for the lineup. We want a high score. We want a higher score than anybody else, or high enough to get paid. And this, the biggest part of this challenge, of this challenge is defining utility. It's kind of, economists have a formal definition of utility, uh, but player uh, contestants will. Uh, vary in their financial objectives, how much uh, how much they play, and so on. So that that's a big part of the of the challenge. Wow, that's a hard problem. Boy, I'll say. Technically, it's a constrained, multi-objective optimization with incomplete information. There's two basic things we don't know. When we enter the lineup, we don't know how the players are going to uh, perform relative to their skill level. And the other thing we don't know is how the other contestants are going to uh, build their lineups. I know, let's build an AI to solve it. Well, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is, there's oodles of research since World War II. The same, the same people, uh, after, after the Manhattan Project was a success, these people all went out, um, they went back to school, and they developed these things called operations research, uh, management science. It's, it's been a heavily researched area since uh, well, during World War II and, and afterwards. We have powerful desktop computers. My, my workstation at home has got eight cores, four gigahertz, something like 32 gigaflops if you, if you really max it out. We have cutting edge algorithms, heuristics, and we have meta heuristics now. And the other thing is that there's mostly, mostly accurate, mostly real time data available on uh, what the players are doing. Uh, for baseball, they actually have cameras in all of the ballparks tracking every pitch back behind the strike zone, the pitcher pitches. Um, uh, they have cameras tracking the balls. They have cameras tracking uh, the basketball players on the court. Well, the bad news is 
sites have uh, prohibited robot contestants, and they've prohibited uh, scrapers. So, however smart the AI gets, it's still only an advisor. Because you can't have scrapers, it needs, we need to actually go and look at the contests and decide which ones we want to enter. And it needs us to actually post the lineups. If we can't write a robot and say, OK, we'll gener generate 1,500 lineups and go enter one of those 1,500 entry contests with a robot. We can't do that. So there's already pieces of the solution out there. There, there are projection systems that will project how uh, the players are going to do. Uh, there are lineup optimizers that will actually go to the trouble of uh, coming up with an optimum lineup given the projection. Uh, there are lineups for sale. Um, there are various uh, people who give the ticket of the day say this, this particular batter uh, is uh, uh, a, a good play and so forth. Wait, how do the pros do it? There are actually people who do this for a living, who play daily fantasy sport, sports for money. I'm not one of them. And they supplement their winnings with books and affiliate deals with the sites that they have seminars, classes teaching you how to do this, and for speaking engagements. Yeah, but how, how do they win the contest? Well, they have somebody else doing the heavy lifting, the, the, the hard decision science stuff. I already mentioned a related entity. There's a hint. Anybody know what it is? Give you another hint. What happens in Vegas. stays in. Vegas, hey, give that man a cupid dollar, whatever they give out now. That's right, it's the Vegas sports books. The bookmakers project who's going to win the games. So you, you sort of have, if, uh, they've done that. And by how many points? how high the point total is going to be, and sometimes even statistics for individual players. With football, for example, uh, you can bet on how many uh, completed touchdown passes certain quarterbacks are going to make. And even which way the wind's going to be blowing. They, they look at the weather forecast. Is it going to be blowing towards the plate? Going to get the pitcher going to have a tailwind? going to be blowing towards the mound, is the batter going to have a tailwind, going to be blowing sideways. So for example, Vegas says the uh, Phillies uh, win a low scoring game uh, with the win towards the plate. So you roster the Phillies pitcher. Vegas says the Brewers are going to win a high scoring game with the win towards left field, so you roster some of the Brewers batters. Vegas says the Warriors are going to meet, beat the Knicks by 25 points. Well, you don't roster anybody from this game because what's going to happen is the Warriors will mostly play the bench unless the Knicks take the lead. So it's what they call garbage minutes. So here's a couple of books, and I've got the uh, links references at the end. The slides are going to be posted online, so you don't need to run any of this. Uh, write any of this down. Uh, uh, this covers deriving the wind probabilities from uh, Las Vegas odds numbers and the general mathematics of sports. And it comes with a website with working spreadsheets so you can actually do this stuff without having to know uh, our programming. And then the theory of gambling and statistical logic. Uh, this has all the understand how to understand the payout structures, um, gambler's fallacies, bankroll management, uh, utility and game theory. Okay, I still want to build the AI. <laughs> I think you can say that. So I went and collected all the relevant software I could find. Uh, Fedora Linux, which is my 
currently favored Linux distro. Uh, R, R Studio and Shiny, uh, a bunch of package management, uh, data wrangling, visualization, and authoring tools. It's all packed up as a Docker image. And there's a whole, I'm going to just buzz through the list of all the packages. Uh, you can read it uh, on the website. There's packages, there's a scraper for the NHL, a uh, scraper for NBA. Uh, there's a football ranking uh, package, it's a soccer kind of football. Uh, general sports analytics. And of course, it's 100% open source. Now that's where all of the software lives. And again, this will all be posted uh, on the website if you want to download it. And there's the Docker image. So now I'm going to go in and talk a little bit about the NBA. I started playing uh, Daily Fantasy in uh, February on the NBA. Uh, there's something in the schedule about how I came to do this. Uh, but basically what was happening is I, I was interested in robot journalism. And that's uh, for the science nerds, that's uh, natural language generation. What these robot journalists were doing, they're going out and getting finance data and sports data and writing, writing news stories. And the Associated Press uh, contracted with one of these people. Uh, and like, I'm also an investor or trader sort of thing. And that's exactly the opposite of what an investor wants. An investor wants the data, wants the numbers, wants an API, uh, you know, wants all that good stuff. Um, and I said, well, what about? What about the sports people? And I said, well, you know, that's, that's like Las Vegas, you know, it's not, not the, the real world. Um, and then one of the leading purveyors of sports statistics bought one of the natural language uh, companies, uh, one of the natural language generation companies, and they started, they closed the deal with, I think, Associated Press uh, to cover college basketball. This was right around the time of March Madness, uh, in the lead up to March Madness. And so I said, well, wait a minute, okay. There's this daily fantasy sports thing. And so I started digging into it and just went down the rabbit hole. And somebody once said, well, when Life hands and rabbit holes make cost effort. So I did, and I started playing. I'd forgotten how much I loved basketball uh, when, I, when I was a kid. It's really, it's really my game. I, you know, baseball was a big deal, but uh, never been anywhere uh, that they had a decent team. So I'm playing the easy uh, $1, 50-50 contest. You pay a dollar to get in. If you rank in the top half, you get a buck 80 back. This is how the site makes money. In theory, uh, you should get $2 back. So they, uh, they take 20% off the top. You get your dollar. If, you, if, you, if you're in the top half, you get your dollar back plus 80 cents. If you rank in the bottom half, you lose the dollar. So theoretically, you've got a 50% chance of winning unless you do something stupid, like, uh, you know, like playing, uh, like rostering a pitcher uh, who, uh, who doesn't show up, who isn't in the lineup that day. Uh, I was losing too many contests. Theoretically, you should get about 50-50, and I was I was hitting about 35 percent. The other the other 60 percent were uh, were real winners. They they were up in the like ranking uh, two and three out of a couple hundred. Uh, but I was losing more than I was winning. So the free picks weren't helping. The free projections weren't helping. The free optimizers weren't helping. 
I couldn't afford a paid service and play at a buck a day. And for the paid service, is only like 20 bucks a month at the low end. So I kind of dug into what the optimizers were doing. Essentially, they're doing linear programming. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward, constrained linear program, mixed integer linear program for the operations research geeks. Um, you have to fill all the slots in the lineup, um, and you maximize the score subject to the constraint of the, the salary. You can't go over the salary cap. Um, so, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward problem that has been since uh, the 1940s. Well, they, they weren't doing a couple of things. They weren't accounting for the distributions of the scores. They were, they were using the average or the projected average because that's how their projections work. They take a, the player's average and they um, adjust it for other factors, like, for example, home court the basketball, uh, home court advantage, um, and the opposing team's defensive strength. It's really a simple. It, it works, more or less. Uh, there, there are more complicated ways to do it, uh, but this works. And the other problem with that is averages aren't robust. But if, uh, if uh, like Russell, Russell Westbrook had one, uh, one game where he, I think he posted like 110 fantasy points, that's going to bring his average way up even though it may not be representative of, uh, of how he's really playing, his real strength. It's uh, too sensitive to outliers. So I built a gizmo to go look at the uh, score distributions. So download some detailed game data, calculate fantasy points, uh, and, and look at the distributions of the, of the fantasy points, and make uh, box and whisker plots. The data, there are free scrapers for the NBA, but I went, I went and uh, subscribed to a paid service because I wanted to get on the air quickly. I didn't want to spend a couple of weeks trying to figure out, get the scraper working. So I can't open source the data, but the code is open source, and it'll be, uh, there's an R notebook. Uh, again, you don't have to write any of this down. Uh, and there's a rendered version on my sports blog at the dfs.tools. And so, quick guide to box and whisker plots. I'm gonna, the next slide is going to be a box and whisker plots. There's a center line, there's a box, and there's two whiskers coming off the box, and then there's points, there's outliers. So, the higher the center line, the better the median score. Now again, the median is a more robust measure of the core strength of a player than the average because it's not sensitive to outliers. The wider the box, uh, the larger the interquartile range is. Now the interquartile range is a more robust measure of consistency. A narrow box is a consistent player. A wide box is an inconsistent player. And then the points outside the whiskers are outliers. And you're going to see some outliers. And if the line isn't in the middle of the box, the distribution is skewed. Ordinarily, um, statisticians and people uh, who do this they love, they love to talk about the Gaussian distribution. It's probably very called the normal distribution. Gaussian distribution, it's symmetric. It has certain really nice properties. Um, and if you do enough little things and add them up, you get one. Um, it, it's an easy assumption to make. It just doesn't happen to reflect reality sometimes. And, in the case of uh, basketball player fantasy points, it turned out it didn't. Uh, so if the line isn't in the middle of the box, the distribution is skewed. If the line is closer to the top of the box than the bottom, that means the area in the... Okay, the, the line is lower. The area above the line is bigger. That's good skew. That means, that means uh, 
the player has what the, the fantasy uh, contestants call upside. But if the line is higher, if it's above the line, if the area below the line is bigger, that's bad skew. It means uh, it has downside. So uh, I don't, let uh, see how, do I need to blow this up? I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to point out a couple guys. Here's Russell Westbrook. Whoops, down back. Here's Russell Westbrook, Westbrook on the right hand end. This guy did not make the playoffs. He comes uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, but, man, that guy can really pick the ball and get points. Uh, he, I, I, there was one contest when he got like 100 and some odd points. But you say the line here, and the, the line in the box is higher than the, the middle. So he's got he's got a low side. Um, this point up here, 100 and some odd fantasy points, that's an outlier. That would skew his average. Um, but it's not something you can depend on. Uh, here's another guy. Let me, Here's a guy with good skills, Stephen Curry. Uh, he's the most valuable player of the year. Uh, led the Warriors to uh, victory. Uh, the, the, he's more consistent. And uh, the, his skew is in the positive direction. And we pick up one more. Ah, here's a little one over here. Again, he's got negative skew. He's nowhere, he's nowhere near as good as uh, Russell Westbrook, no matter what he says. <laughs> and, okay, here's another guy with two outliers. That's Kyrie Irving. So he had a couple of really, really good nights. Brought his average way up. So what was happening was the optimizers were going for the gold. They they give me like one or two high-end players like uh, Westbrook or Harden or LeBron, and to keep under the salary cap, they were putting in the lower price players with scrubs. And so I went and did box plots for everybody. Um, above a certain value. I mean, it, it, you don't need to do all 500 uh, NBA players, just the ones that actually show up in the optimized lineups. Uh, they had low medians, they had, or they had wide boxes, or they had outliers on the bottom. And you know, they weren't on that chart. Um, I, I ended up throwing out everybody that was above the me that was below the median and still had plenty of, uh, uh, plenty of players to work with. So they went. Uh, the optimizers have a little, uh, little button where you can exclude a player. So I went and uh, excluded all the scrubs. And ran. the projected optimum score dropped. And sometimes it would uh, take Westbrook or Davis or Harden or LeBron away from me. But it would give me John Wall, it would give me Stephen Curry, uh, a couple of other people. Uh, I'd get consistent players, I would get, uh, uh, get people who, uh, who would always uh, come in. And my win rate went up. And the season ended. <laughs> so, if there's any doubt, anybody had any doubt that the Warriors were the best team going into the playoffs. This is box plots for the, the team fantasy points for the 16 teams in the playoffs. That's the Warriors. That's the Clippers. Everybody, Remember how everybody was surprised how far the Clippers went? My surprise was that Houston beat them because Houston's down here. And there's San Antonio. 
the top four teams in the playoff are in the Western Conference. You can't go all the way down to number five before you've got somebody in the Eastern Conference, and that's Atlanta, and there's Cleveland. So why did Cleveland beat Atlanta? Well, here is Atlanta. They're consistent, but they couldn't reach the high. They couldn't reach the high end here. The, Cle the Cleveland. Yeah. So Cleveland was able to get up here in the Eastern in the Eastern uh, Finals, and Atlanta just couldn't get up there. So more reading. This book is a gold mine. This is this is the the Sabermetrics book of basketball. Um, if, if, you, if you're interested in basketball statistics, you probably already know about this book. Um, but if you're getting interested in it, there it is. So next step, I'm going to skip over a fair amount of this uh, baseball stuff, uh, mostly because it's buggy. I'm just going to... Uh, Major League Baseball is the second biggest money game after NFL. It's not quite as predictable as uh, basketball, but it's more predictable than football. And of course, it's now playing at a ballpark near you, in Seattle, I guess. And there's lots of sabermetric theory to work with. I probably there are at least five good books on it, and, uh, and more that's not very good. Uh, open War is a, an R package that I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm, I'm using it. Uh, it is as free as in beer, but not as in freedom data from the MOB. Is that 10 or 5? 10. 10. Oh, okay. I'll make it. Um, it's open source R code on GitHub. The input data is detailed down to the individual plate appearances. You can actually go more detailed. You can actually go pitch by pitch, uh, but this program doesn't. It computes uh, fielding, pitching, base running, and batting statistics, uh, and comes up with something called runs above average, runs created. That's the standard sabermetric. Uh, Evaluation, they do everything in terms of one runs and in games one. And it reduces them to a metric called war, which is wins above replacement player. So basically they, they say, okay, how many runs did this guy create? How many runs would a replacement player create? Subtract the two and convert runs to wins what you do by a piece of magic called dividing by 10. And the nice thing about this is that this program can estimate the distribution of wins above replacement. So I start to think, can I use this as a DFS projection tool? It's intended to be a measure of the overall quality of a player. It factors out things like ballpark, uh, advantages, a batter versus pitcher handedness. Um, so it, it's it's kind of saying what it, there, there's supposed to be a correlation between a real world player's wins above replacement and a real world player's salary on a team. So I said, okay, well. That ought to work for fantasy sports, too. I ought to be able to take the wins above replacement and correlate it with the fantasy salary. And indeed, you sort of can. Uh, at any rate, uh, the DFS pitchers accumulate fantasy points only for pitching. Uh, even if they bat, like in the National League, um, if, they, if they happen to catch a ball, uh, they're fielding, if they bat, they, if they're base running, it, uh, they, they don't get any fantasy points for that. So rather than use the wins above replacement, I'm using the subset of the replacement uh, of the runs above average uh, just as pitching. And the same thing's true of um, fantasy points uh, for batters. They only get 
points for batting and base running. They don't get points for uh, a double play or uh, uh, they don't lose points for an error. So I'm fitting the fantasy points as a linear function of the batting plus the base running. You do get the points for stolen bases. So there's a scatter plot. This is I'm, I'm not happy with this, and this is why I'm not going to spend too much time with it. But essentially, here's a, for pitchers, here's the runs above average, uh, and the average fantasy points per game. And it, it's a nice fit, but you can do better. Because you've got the detailed data, you can calculate exactly how many fantasy points they got. You don't need to, you don't need to run this fancy runs above average model compare a player with uh, an average player. You just need to figure out how many fantasy points he got. And the same thing, um, so there's the top 10 pitchers by this metric. I ran this a few days ago, and this is just 2015 data. Uh, this guy is uh, Sonny Gray, uh, Dallas Kiko, uh, Zach Greinke, uh, Max Gertzer, I forget Archer's first name and DeGrom's first name. A couple of names that you probably hear if you follow baseball a lot uh, that aren't in this list. Uh, if you follow baseball a lot, you hear Felix Hernandez, uh, the Seattle pitcher. Uh, you hear Madison Bumgarner, the San Francisco pitcher. pitcher. You hear Clayton Kershaw, who's uh, the Dodgers pitcher. I mean, these are the three superstars in fantasy sports. They're not in this. They're not in the top ten. They're, they're down a little further. And that says something. And there's a scatter plot for batters. I did the same thing. It's basically base running statistics. Uh, top ten batters by runs above average. Now here's some names you probably have heard. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt, uh, Bryce Harper, I think it's Brandon Crawford, Matt Carpenter, Anthony Riz Rizzo, uh, Miguel Cabrera. Uh, <coughs> the, these are names that you've, that you've probably heard. But there's one name that you've probably heard that isn't on this. Mike Trout isn't on that list. He's, this is very much a work in progress. It's experimental. It's buggy. I'm hacking on it every day. I'm really not going to post much source code. Uh, essentially, I have to fork open war and refactor it to, to compute the fantasy statistics directly. And I don't know that the open war project people even want that. Um, I'm sure they take the I'm sure they take the refactoring part, but the rest of it I don't know I don't know that they care about. And uh, the other the other problem is that the data is free of charge, but it's not free to redistribute. So. Yeah. And there's the paper that explains all the models. Uh, you need to know four. Okay. You need to know some statistics and um, some sabermetrics uh, to read that, but it's pretty good. So the next steps, uh, MBA, I'm going to switch to the R base scraper, uh, not because I can't afford the other data, but just because then everything will be open source and I can open source links to the data and everything. Uh, I'm going to switch to violin plots uh, instead of box plots because they show the shape of the distribution. Uh, develop a total open source uh, projection system um, so that you don't have to pay any money and you don't, and so you know what's going into it so it's not a, a, a closed system. And an open source optimizer using some better optimization than uh, linear programming. And all a bunch of refactoring and packaging and publishing. And I might do a detailed analysis of the 2014, 2015 uh, uh, season. I, I have the code, uh, and I don't see any reason not to. Uh, NHL, there's an open source NHL scraper. Uh, Portland may be getting a team. 
So I'll probably develop an open source forecaster and optimizer uh, for uh, uh, the NHL. And football? Well, so far I haven't found an open source scraper. The NBA season starts before the NFL season ends, so you know, I'd, I'd kind of be uh, kind of a time management thing. Did I mention I don't really like football? So uh, source repositories. Um, here's the presentation. Um, there's the R notebook. Um, there's one in there at the moment, which is the kind of a, a, a more narrative version of the NBA stuff I did. Um, there's the whole OS Journal project, and there's the Docker image, and there's the Open Water repository. And there's the NBA scraper, and there's the NHL scraper. So questions and answers. We've got about three minutes. If anybody's got any questions.